Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this workshop on how not to break your soul in the pursuit of social justice, values-based tools for preservation and empowerment, presented by the UC Davis Campus Community Book Project. My name is Megan Macklin, and I serve as a program manager in the Office of Campus Community Relations at UC Davis, where I manage the book project. Thank you for joining. While we meet today in a virtual space, we'd like to begin by reading the following statement that acknowledges the land where UC Davis sits. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putlin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putlin tribes, Cachal Dihi Band of Wintu Nations of the Calusa Indian Community, Quetzal Dihi Wintu Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintu Nation. The Putlin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. To begin a couple of housekeeping items for our virtual event, captions can be accessed by clicking the live transcript button on your Zoom window. There you can hide or show the subtitles and access the full transcript. Today's event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. We encourage you to turn on your video. It's great, especially for our speaker to see faces. And you are invited to ask questions or share comments in the chat at any point during the event. The UC Davis Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Campus Community Relations since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus climate and community relations, to foster diversity, and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in its 20th year, the book project in 2021-2022 focuses on the theme of social justice in practice and features How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Our theme and selection are supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more. Our program culminates when author Ibram X. Kendi comes to UC Davis on Thursday, March 31, 2022 to speak at the Mandavi Center for the Performing Arts. For more information about the book project program, please visit our website where you can find up-to-date information, registration links, and other resources. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members in selecting the book project featured title and in planning our annual program. If you're interested in getting involved with the book project, please send us an email or you can refer to the book project website for more information. And now, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tracy Thomas, who will lead us in a workshop on how not to break your soul in the pursuit of social justice, values-based tools for preservation and empowerment. Tracy Thomas is a California licensed marriage and family therapist working as a community counsel, counselor for student health and counseling services at UC Davis. Tracy earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in communication, communication studies from UCLA and her Master of Arts degrees from Brandman University. Through her work in a nonprofit community health care center throughout the Sacramento area, she has compassionately provided mental health care services to culturally and socioeconomically diverse populations from marginalized, underrepresented, and underserved communities, including Native American and Indigenous populations. Tracy has specialized interest, training, and experience in treating symptoms of PTSD and trauma, including intergenerational trauma experienced by oppressed people. She uses eye movement desensitization and reprocessing as a primary tool to help clients heal from traumatic experiences. Additionally, through her work experience in a partial hospitalization program, she has specialized training in treating eating disorders and other co-occurring mental illnesses using acceptance and commitment therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. Her theoretical orientation is primarily humanistic. Tracy's personal philosophy in counseling is rooted in the belief that regardless of the complex emotional challenges that one might be facing, each person can experience emotional freedom and reach his or her maximum potential in life. She enjoys helping students embrace their intersecting identities into a healthy, holistic, and integrated self, sense of self. Tracy celebrates her multicultural ethnicity, including honoring and giving back to her Chaka identity. Tracy, we're thrilled to have you this evening and please take it away. All right. Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all. Wow, we've got a good audience here, which means there could be some burnout happening right now, um, a lot of interest. And so I want to take a little moment to just acknowledge that. I hope that you take really good care of yourself during this presentation, have some water, some tea, kind of get relaxed. 
we're going to talk a little bit about trauma, not specifically about personal traumas, but we will touch on how trauma impacts the brain in terms of social justice, um, activism, burnout, or racial justice um, fatigue. So just want to make sure that you take good care of yourself all along the way. Let's kind of huddle in. If you can almost imagine that we're a team and we're huddling in right now, uh, we're getting ready. We're getting ready to get real with it, right? So I want us to all gather around or imagine that we're huddling together because some of you might be experiencing some symptoms of tra um, trauma and burnout right now. And uh, we're all in this together. So really quickly love for you to put in the chat as to what it is that you're, why, why you came tonight. Like you've had a full work day. You're probably exhausted. Something about this topic really spoke to you. So I'd love to hear some comments, raise your hand or just shout out or put it in the chat. What is it that you're hoping to get out of this presentation today? Why did you come? Anybody? What would you, what are you hoping to walk away with? I, can we just share, like, I, I want to just be able to, to continue the work while also finding balance and taking care of yourself. Okay, thank you. So you, key word, I want to continue this work. I want to be in it for the long haul, right? I don't want to burn out. I want to be able to just keep it in balance and feel a little bit better in my body and mind while doing this good work. Okay. Anybody else? Let's see what's going on in the chat. So many challenges in work and life right now. Absolutely. I mean, we all can attest to that. Want to continue this work in a healthy way. Um, we all, because I love you as a speaker and I feel like I volunteer too much. Yeah, you're, you're probably brilliant and bright and people are tapping in. They're tapping into that energy. Joseph. Thank you, Tracy. I think in twofold, one is that for me to be able to learn and maybe practice more of the things that I can do, um, but also as well as I try to support my colleagues and group that I'm on that's doing social justice work. Um, I think that's hopefully, I might hear some stuff during the presentation today to think about that and then role model that for other folks, as well as students, right? I work with a lot of students that are doing some of this work um, and they often <clears throat> could benefit seeing some of these techniques. Absolutely. So you work in a team, you want to help your team, you want to help yourself, you want to pass on the knowledge to others who might be, whom could benefit some, from some of these tips. All right, we have some others who raised their hand. How about James? Yes, uh, nice to meet you, Tracy. Um, yeah, so just more so just preventative measures. Like I know I could easily get there because that's what possibly comes along with like kind of being involved in social justice burnout. And social justice is that burnout may or may not happen. And so just kind of thinking of tools and tips I can take to kind of like prevent myself from getting to that point. Okay, so you're not there now, but you've heard some things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Anybody else, do I have any other hands raised? I can't really see, but I hear people struggling with work and balance, you know, afraid of burnout. Any other hands raised? Boundaries, feeling overwhelmed. Okay, all right, let's get started. I'm gonna try to get through this first part as as quick, quicker than possible, because I don't want to spend too much time on what is activism fatigue and burnout, because that's where a lot of presentations focus on and people leave kind of like really sad. And they were like, I didn't learn how to like, you know, prevent it or stop it, but we do need to know why it happens. Right. So let's huddle in. And I want you all to get real honest with yourselves. Right. We're gonna, we're gonna dive in and we're gonna really look at what's happening in your brain, what's happening in your, in kind of like the personality characteristics um, that you might have that's contributing to this fatigue and stress. So what are we talking about when we talk about burnout and activism fatigue? We're talking about chronic and accumulative stressors, not only based on your identities and seeing things that are happening out in the world, George Floyd, the pandemic, climate change, so many stressors having back to back out in the world and also within your own environments with the students that you're working with, 
right? And the jobs that you're doing and the activism work that you're faced with is constant and chronic, right? And then on top of that, we have intergenerational trauma layers. So not only are we dealing with all of the stressors and, that are coming through the, the world and our events and our students and our families, but we're looking at intergenerational trauma that is kind of packed on with it. When you think about racism, oppression, slavery, you know, all of these different things that have happened to cultures, that trauma has been kind of brought into our personal lives in the day-to-day -day and we're not even aware of it. Okay, so we've got layers, we've got chronic stressors, we got intergenerational trauma, slow paced progress and backsliding, right? These are the, the reasons why we burn out. The slow paced progress of getting things done and moving things along can be really frustrating. It's like taking two steps forward and two steps back. Conflicting objectives within the movements and there's retaliation concerns, right? You know, afraid to really get in and do the real work because the real work of social justice requires uncovering some things that are unjust. And you might be in some institutions that don't want you to shine a light on that, right? And that causes a lot of fatigue in, in constantly pushing those envelopes. Sometimes we have infighting among activists, right? In our own centers and our own teams, there gets to be these ego battles of who's doing it better, who's working harder, We've got this martyrdom um, type situation where people are get competitive about their activism. And those are also things that lead to fatigue. So we've got the symptoms of diminished emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being, right? All of these chronic stressors for going on and the slow pace of it can really kind of chip away at our emotional, physical, and spiritual health. We've got high turnover of fellow activists because a lot of times if you're doing volunteer work or if you're at a nonprofit, you may not be getting paid a lot and the wear and tear might be too much loss and not enough gain. And so we're seeing a lot of that happen. Toxic working conditions fueled by the flames that cause burnout. You get a lot of people working together who have these inter intergenerational trauma layers and the chronic stressors, and they may not be taking really good care of themselves. It can kind of really wear and tear, not just on the personal, but as what uh, one of the participants had mentioned on their teams, the teams that you're working on. So chime in the chat if you're kind of like connecting with some of this. But here are the symptoms that you might experience or you might see your colleagues experience that you wanna be watching out for. Disillusionment, right? Just feeling like, gosh, I can't believe I'm, I thought things were gonna be a certain way. I thought we were all gonna be pushing forward on these objectives and nothing seems to be happening. I'm just kind of feeling disillusioned and disconnected with why am I even doing all of this, right? a cynical attitude where you just feel like nothing's going to, to work ever. These symptoms are heavy even if I, as I'm speaking it, because I would hate to think that any of you are feeling this way, but there is absolutely no shame if you're feeling this right now. And that's why we're here, to work on it and to prevent it from happening because you deserve a very healthy, productive, peaceful life. And that's what I want for you. So notice if you're having strained relationships or feelings of hopelessness, or even that you're working 10, 12 hours and you just don't seem to be effective. Nothing seems to be actually really, you're doing a lot of stuff, but it doesn't seem to be adding up to much. Okay. I'm sorry, it's hard for me to see the slides with all of these buttons around here. Um, so the characteristics of an activist who might be burning out, right? Let's talk about this. And I want you to maybe even write down or, or name some of these things that you might be experiencing or these characteristics that you might have. So if you're involved in, in social justice activities, you, you might have an acute awareness of these large scale injustices, whether it be police brutality or whatever it is that you're working on, 
the more awareness you have, the more you start diving deeper into the problem. And boy, when you start diving deeper into that problem, you start recognizing the problem everywhere, right? In media, in politics, in your institutions, even in your own families. Um, people can't seem to get enough rest because all of a sudden this knowledge is power, but it's knowledge is also can be burdensome. And then that creates this enormous feeling of responsibility. I have this knowledge and I've got to do something with it. I've got to be the one to fix it. And there's a, the burden is high because knowledge is not broad enough. There's not enough people doing this type of work to spread it all around. The good news about what happened with George Floyd uh, a couple summers ago is that more people have been on board than ever before, I think, in some of these, in some of these uh, issues. And so we've got a little bit more help, but not enough people who are truly knowledgeable and feel responsible to carry it on. And we tend to feel like we need to take up the slack. What's also happening, especially in these student organizations, which it took me years to kind of figure out what's happening here. Like there's this culture of martyrdom that is evidenced in literature where there's this inability to disconnect from the work. There is this encouragement to work to exhaustion. It's this badge of honor that you need to be doing more and you need to work harder. And there's this guilt tripping that comes in there um, that is just everyone's fueling and almost encouraging burnout by these activities. And then we've got the stress that comes from resistance to activism that really wears us down in our health and our minds and our bodies. And this is also evidenced. And I'm wondering if anybody's feeling some of these things, but there's, there can be some institutional retribution to, to pushing these envelopes, right? Because social justice and fighting it requires resistance. There's no other way around it. And sometimes we're working in an organization that really savors and promotes the past of least resistance. So you're pushing, and they're like, slow down, <laughs> calm down, don't be so angry. Like, take a, we're gonna need to take some more time. And that time and that patience tends to wear out. Some people have, have talked about hiring and promotion discrimination, asked to soften their voice, um, denial of racism, and saying, you know, I think you might be overreacting, invalidation of your activism. And then sometimes there's bullying that happens between colleagues and students. So when we talk about the brain and why um, burnout happens, we look at this unrelenting stressful events. So, wow. I mean, most of the time, these are like green, 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 a little bit orange, green, 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 a little bit orange, maybe a red here and there. But most of the time we get a long time to recover from traumatic events and stressful events so that the brain can repair itself. Well, lately we've got the fires, the pandemic, you know, police brutality, uh, murders, all the political fights, um, possibly a war in Russia. Like it just seems like we're not able to give our brain the rest that it absolutely needs to repair. And so we've got to really watch out for that. We've got to watch out for that. So let's talk about the brain a little bit more in terms of its trauma responses. So remember, we talked about those intergenerational layers of, of trauma that we've been carrying, plus the chronic stressors and events, plus the work that you're doing every day with either students or clients or wherever you're working. And you're also around your team's burnout and all the trauma that they've experienced. And, uh, and what the brain's, how it manifests is obviously fight, fight, or freeze, or fawn. So in, in terms of these team environments, you might have people who are really angry and they have outbursts or they're bullying or they might have narcissistic behaviors, right? Because their brain is constantly in fight mode. So if they, if, if administration or an organization doesn't tell the truth 
or they feel manipulated or things are not going fast enough. It's not just that they're frustrated, but you are actually, you know, infringing on my safety. And so I'm going to react with a lot of anger to make sure to rein you back in so that I can feel safe again. That's how trauma manifests. It also can be flight, right? That person that can't get out of that person that's overworking, like working all the time on these activities, and they can't stop, they're overthinking everything, or they're perfectionists. They can't just let something go and turn something in. It's got to be perfect. And we, none of us can ever be perfect. And so this keeps us in this burn. This keeps us way in the burnout phase. These two right here allow people and acti uh, social activists to be more burnout than ever, because either you're, you're so angry, which fuels the work to burn out, or you're making everything working so hard to avoid feeling unsafe. And then there's the freeze response, right? Inability to make decisions, disassociating, kind of feeling numb, like that's where you're spinning your wheels, where you're thinking you're working and doing something, but nothing's happening because you're really in this freeze to feel safe again. And then the other part of how trauma manifests in burnout is this people pleasing, right? Codependency, the no boundaries, saying yes to everything, volunteering for everything, because you, you need to feel safe by, by pleasing people. So all of these four things are always about safety. How does your brain feel safe when it's been traumatized? How does it protect you? It protects you with this over response and this over response leads to burnout because it's not balanced. So how do we start fixing some of this stuff, right? So let me, let me repeat myself about trauma and really kind of explain and, and can, um, I'm not sure what's going on in the chat. If there's something there, I wanna really make sure we stop to look at that. Okay. It feels sometimes like the only options are to be angry all of the time or start to normalizing injustice the moment we stop being angry. Wow. And I wanna challenge you a little bit on that, Julian, because you, you hit it right on the head. You do need some anger. Anger is a good emotion that helps to change things. We need to start being mindful and recognizing how much anger do we need to be motivated and to move things along. And how much is this anger hurting me and robbing me of joy? And the most important thing is how can we keep some of that anger? but also notice all of the beauty and all of the joy that's happening all around us that have nothing to do with the issue that we're working on. It's that balance to be able to do both. That's what we're gonna work on today. How can we do both and never let one or the other get completely out of control? So let me get this. I can't get this off of here. All right, trauma. And all the things, these injustices and the inequity and the discrimination and the racism and all the things that have gone wrong in our lives, even in our families or abuse or whatever, it has this way of creating a negative limiting belief about ourselves. Trauma will have it, you believe that there's something wrong with you, that somehow all of this stuff is your fault, that you are responsible for fixing it. You're the only one who could fix it right? That you need fixing and you're constantly looking outward to see how you can fulfill this awful feeling in your hole in your chest that might have been created by the trauma. And it's kind of false, right? It's, it's an illusion. All of these negative beliefs were created by your brain because if, if your brain could get you to believe that you need to fix it, then perhaps you can finally get to safety. But it goes into overdrive and becomes hypersensitive to trauma because you haven't had time to rest and repair. So everything looks like it needs fixing. And that's not necessarily true. 
The truth is it's not your fault. You didn't cause this. You don't have to fix it. You're perfect just as you are. Everyone can do their part. And even if they don't do their part, you don't have to do it for them. You can decide what your personal capacity is, the, the time frame and the space and the energy that you can give while keeping yourself healthy and vibrant and joyful. And you can be okay with just that, doing your part, not everybody else's. Okay. If that's true, right? I want you just to imagine if you didn't have any negative limiting beliefs inside your brain about all these horrible things and injustices that have gone wrong and all of your knowledge about it and all of your responsibility, what if it wasn't your fault at all? What if you could be joyful and have fun and move, move things along in increments and do your part and be truly satisfied with that? Who would you be in this world? What would your work look like when you show up to work and when you leave at the end of the day? How tired are you gonna feel or how energetic are you gonna feel if it wasn't your fault and it's not your responsibility to fix it? I want you to think about that. Just imagine how different would it be? So let's talk a little bit more about the polyvagal theory and the nervous system in your brain and what's happening, right? So we talked about the four defenses, fight, freeze, uh, <laughs> fight, freeze, flight, or fawn, right? That creates these characteristics that lead to um, fatigue and burnout. And this is another way of looking at it, right? So in order for for your brain to feel safe. Like none of these things that are happening out in the world make me feel safe. And so I've got to power over. I've got to really engage and be active to fight oppression. And so this puts me in the constant state of fight, flight, or hide. I've got to be on alert, hyperactive to protect myself so that I can get back to safety. That's what the brain thinks it needs to do, right? against these life-threatening things that are happening. What helps us to create that balance is that hybrid state, right? So yes, we can mobilize to feel safe, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be fighting, fight, or hide. It can actually be yoga, dance, sport, or engaged, satisfying, fulfilling work. That's also mobilization. And when we're life-threatening, we don't necessarily always have to freeze, right? We don't always have to fight. We can actually get some rest. We can get nourishment and sleep and meditation. So what we're doing is we're, we're balancing this need to feel safe and this mobilization to fight against oppression, but we're also mobilizing our, our self-care and resting so that we can get to the green beautiful green state of balance, which is hybrid, where we're playing, we're having fun, we're sensual, we can, we can experience pleasure, we're empowered, we feel fulfilled, we make agreements and we can make choices about what it is that we're gonna do. If we're always on this side, there's no choice. The brain goes in auto drive to protect you, you're overworking, you're overthinking, you're stressed out, and we wanna get into the hybrid state. So what we talked about a little bit is this, how angry do you really need to be, right? In order to move things along and stay engaged in this work without burning out. And this is gonna take some mindfulness. So I want to challenge you this week, just every day, every couple of hours, I just want you to practice checking in, just check in with yourself, how am I feeling? Where am I at with my emotions? How am I feeling right now? Engage where you're at, right? So this is where we wanna be. We wanna be between, this is hard, 
you know, it's this tough challenge. These people haven't been getting back to me or I'm waiting and it's really frustrating, but I'm okay. Or I'm cool and collected. You can get a little uncomfortable and heated up at times because you're like, hey, this is violating my rights and, you know, we got to move things along. I mean, we can feel relaxed sometimes. But we don't want to be so green that we're just like laying around and just not doing anything, right? <laughs> but we also don't want to be exploding out of control. And this is the part where we start damaging relationships, damaging our health. And so how do we balance that? Self-care, we hear it all day, every day, right? Get more self-care, but it becomes this meaningless word that we have to start applying some meaning to it. In order to get to that green hybrid state, you've gotta be super protective about your time and energy so that you have time and energy to spend on these things. Working out and exercising, learning how to accept the things that are completely out of your control. There are some things you're just not going to be able to do. There's some things in some organizations where you're working where there's just so many obstacles and roadblocks or you don't have a big enough team, you're going to have to learn to figure that out and to accept how much movement can you possibly have. Learning how to have pleasure, right? How do you learn to allow yourself? You have a right to feel pleasure and joy. Absolutely, there are a lot of wrong things happening and people are suffering. That is absolutely true. And it's also true that kindness is happening, that there's beauty in the world, that somebody's told a funny joke and you laughed your head off. One of these students, a couple of students I work with, you know, one of the, the things that they tell me is, I didn't know until after we had some of these presentations, I didn't know that it was okay to not be angry all of the time. Because in these environments, you're almost forced to like, to be the real one, to be down and, and to be a martyr and to, to give of yourself. And you gotta be angry to show that, that you care. And they think that anger is the thing that's gonna move things along all of the time. And so when they began to give themselves full permission to actually experience the fulfilling, enhancing joy of all of the things they're actually fighting for, right? So think about your social justice, things that you're fighting for. You're fighting for equality, for nutritious meals, for excellent health care, for clean air and clean water, for the ability to, to go anywhere you want without discrimination or racism. And so do all of those things now. Do as much as you possibly can to enjoy the rights that you're fighting for. Because that's ultimately at the end of the day, why you're working so hard. And so give yourself a chance to really feel that pressure. Pleasure activism, the politics feeling good. Adrian Mario Brown, okay, well, let's look at that. Thank you for that resource. Hmm. Yeah, that, that being then that rage all of the time. Okay, so, so let me talk about this, James Baldwin. To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost all of the time. That, that's a response, right, to all of the injustices that rage lives inside of us. And yet I saw this beautiful picture of Cesar Chavez doing a yoga pose and Martin Luther King, um, you know, doing some really wonderful spiritual work and laughing and playing cards and having fun with his buddies in between the work, right? We see all, of, I, I did some research, I wish I would have showed you these pictures, but if you think of any of the activists that we know of that are famous, they are absolutely not putting themselves in rage and danger and, and horrible negative feelings all of the time. They are, they are practicing radical self-care. They're meditating, they're doing yoga, they're singing, they're praying, they're spending time with family, they're having barbecues and cookouts. 
they're drinking a little wine, they're dancing, they're doing a lot to keep themselves going and to allow themselves to enjoy everything that they're fighting for. And then when it's time to march and time to do all of the hard, difficult work, they do that too. And they're trying to find balance just like all of you. We just don't get enough chance to see that, right? But I think one of the things that you can practice is load your social media up with the most positive news and pictures. Like um, I think Yes We Can is one example of showing beautiful pictures of people doing all kinds of wonderful things. We have, um, there's a lot of goodness that's actually really happening, but we, we have our, 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 that negativity bias, right? That works in our brain, that's trying to keep us safe, keep us all safe is to, we're wired to notice the horrible, bad, awful injustices so that we can protect ourselves against that. And absolutely these other things are happening, but we gotta work really hard to integrate them into our practice, into our brain and into our life. Okay. So looking at all of the, the different points of wellness, right? Your social justice work and your activism is one part of your life. I heard the best thing the other day. Um, I know when these students are starting to heal and they're starting to find balance and they're starting to find joy and they're not doing activism 24 hours a day, looking at like a hundred of the most brutal, awful videos on social media. When I know that this is happening is when they say something like, gosh, you know, the chancellor's video with this, you know, with his wife, the little Thursday videos and they're laughing and they're talking about movies. That really brought me a lot of joy today. I just, I literally fall over because that's when I know that they're starting to work on their brain and, and moving it towards balance and joy and doing some work in between because they can recognize that it's okay. It's okay for our black chancellor and his black wife to be joking about the movies and talking about the trips they're taking this summer because we know they're working extremely hard and yet they're, they're also enjoying life. And that's totally okay. And we've got we've to celebrate that. Okay, let's look at the chat, see what's chiming in. Are, are people resonating with this? Like, are you, let's see, showed photos of her father riding a bike. Yes, playing pool, puppy and cat videos. Absolutely. I spent some time really reorganizing my YouTube, my social media feeds. I have loaded myself up with every positive affirmation, spirituality. I mean, and I'm laughing, like every time I look at it, there's something funny on there. And uh, it just helps to bring balance into your day. Really be careful about what you're putting into your brain and what you're, you're around. You're gonna do the work. All of you who showed up here today, one of the things I know for sure is that you care, you're doing the work, you're not going to leave the work. And so allow it to be a long-term journey, right? Where you get to do your part, whatever that part may be. And you also get to enjoy yourself and be healthy in the process. So how do we do that? Now we're getting to the goodies, okay. Be mindful of your trauma defenses that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. When you are hysterical, it's usually historical. I saw that on a show and I like that language. If you are angry to a 10 and most people around you are about a six, it usually means that there's, inter there's layers of trauma that came before that event that's making you upset. And when you're mindful and you recognize that, just start breathing. This is so simple, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost unfair, right? But when you breathe slowly, four counts in, four counts out, it automatically sends a message to your brain that your body is calm. <laughs> your muscles are relaxed, you must be okay. And if your brain starts to 
get the message that you're okay, then everything starts to calm down. And then you can make a rational decision and be more, more in that green. That's what we're trying to do all day long is stay as much in the green and that middle as possible so that we're effective and not overloaded. This is the one thing I tell my students, never, ever, ever allow anything to get in the way of your basic rights, your basic self-care needs, not even one day. We are fighting for equity and social justice and freedom. No one, I don't care who they are or where you are, gets to make you not eat or go to the bathroom or exercise. Nobody gets to take that away from you. You get to have eight hours of sleep. And if you're not getting it, something has to go. But it can't be these basic self-care needs. Everything else can be reduced, but not the things that keep your body alive. Create, let me see what time we're on, because I get a little winded. <laughs> okay, um, this schedule, so, so some people are really, really good about this, right? If you look at you know, President Obama or all of these really successful, healthy looking people, <laughs> they are really regimented with their schedule. They don't allow anything or anyone to get in the way of what they determine is the thing that's gonna keep them on track. So I want you in the chat to, to chime in. It doesn't have to be exercise, but what are the things that you absolutely know, if you're being honest with yourself, that you cannot go without not even one day in order to keep yourself well and balanced and healthy? And how much are you going to commit to scheduling that in every day and protecting it with, with everything you've got? Walking outside, absolutely, I need my nature walks. Hug and kiss my kids every day. A real dinner, a full night's sleep, I hear you. Beautiful. Taking care of my pets. A coloring book, I love it. Meditation, high fiber diet, yes, gotta keep regular. <laughs> so what I want, I wanna challenge you this week is to, to notice in the past, how many times you have allowed something to squeeze in or take away, or you've renegotiated to where you didn't get to do, or you did not do those things. And I want you to try every day this week, that one thing that you absolutely know that makes you the most well and the most healed, I want you to protect that and schedule that and practice telling somebody no this week if anything gets in the way of that thing. Are we all on board? Okay. So nurture and soothe your nervous system all day long. So you can't really, so when we got these layers of trauma and chronic stressors and vicarious trauma by the people that we're helping and the things that we're reading and all of this knowledge and books that we're reading about all of this, we have to really, really train the brain all day long into slow breathing, mindfulness, having that cup of warm tea, getting that blanket and feeling cozy, walking outside, stepping out and doing a three minute meditation. It needs to be all day long and really allow yourself to feel it and, and experience it so that it can internalize in your brain and your nervous system, okay? Be the best friend in the entire world to yourself. This is what these are. So when I put these two slides together, I've thought about all of the clients that I've seen, all of the workshops that I've done, and the clients who've been the most successful in helping to find balance and to cure depression or you know achieve uh, less symptoms of burnout. These are the things that they did. Okay, saying no, setting up a schedule, breathing protecting their basic self-care needs, being your own super best friend, 
talking kindly to yourself, doing self-compassion, meditations, increasing all the positive, positive material you can muster, photos, affirmations, videos, nature, animals, whatever it is, and find people and activities that make you laugh and bring you joy. You cannot be around someone who is just as angry as you <laughs> all day long. You're not going to make it. <laughs> if, you're, if you're angry all of the time and they're angry all of the time, that's all you're talking about. And we need a break from it. And it's okay to take a break from it. So find ways to satisfy that fight and flight that helps you to also stay in the green. So it may not be writing a ton of letters. It could be asking a friend to support you in terms of raising money. Like whatever the thing that you do for social justice, you can be creative and you can go at it with a different angle that helps you to stay in the green. It doesn't have to be like anyone else. You don't have to go out there and raise a sign all day if your back is like sore and broken. You can do social justice in a way that helps you to feel good. Give yourself permission to do that. And build a community of support, of authenticity, people who hold you accountable. People are like, you need to leave because you've been here for you know 10 hours and you need to get your sleep. People who support you and help you and love you. And uh, I saw a really great example of that on, um, trying to look at the, Renetta Toll is in the audience today and she had this, it was just such a, I never thought of anything so, so sweet and so special. On her birthday, she gathered a lot of these colleagues that she's worked with and, and they talked about the ways that they supported each other along the way in this, in this very way, how they've been this community of support, how they've helped each other and supported each other. And it was just this lovely, very positive thing. So I encourage you to build a community of support like that. Self-compassion, it's so hard. So the brain is wired again to protect you all of the time, especially if you've been traumatized, it's so hypersensitive that the negative is going to be really locked in. And it's, it's, it's gonna be hard to allow the self-compassion because the brain is tricked into believing that if you're relaxing, who's keeping you safe? And so, We've got to, we've got to re retrain the brain and we've got to teach it to do something different. So uh, this is the negativity bias, right? So, so look at all these beautiful things, the flowers, the puppies, you know, the, the jokes and all the things are happening. The brain's like, come on, look over here. And the nervous system, I mean, the, the heart is doing this, but the brain is like, look, can't you see this horrible injustice that's happening? I need to focus all on this. And so we've got to really work at it. So uh, one of the works that's very helpful for this is Dr. Rick Hansen. There's a lot of books and podcasts that he's written to really explain this. But the most important part of it is to elicit the positive feelings and stay with the positive for longer. It, you've got to work with your brain. Your brain is so wired for this. And this is going to take a lot of work. I, I'm just, that's just the way it is. If somebody gives you a compliment today, I want you to take that compliment and really learn to take it in and feel the positive emotions, stay with it longer, thank the person for the feedback, write it down in a little note, visualize it the next day, try to recall when that person said that, how did you feel, what did they look like, remember the smile, and really stay with it for as long as you can and practice that memory as you go throughout the week so that your brain starts to, you're starting to rewire it. Journal about it, visualize it, celebrate all the positives and really keep a running list and practice it every day. Okay, you're gonna have to work at it. There's no way around it, but it does work. Energy vampires. Let's talk a little bit about those people who are tapping in to your energy and your intellect and your and your your skills. Once you become good at social justice or whatever it is that you're good at, people and there's not enough of us. <laughs> there's not enough of us who are doing this work, right? 
And I don't think people mean to take advantage, but your brain knows that it's already in a state of fight or flight. So it's already going to be saying yes, because it believes that if you do more, you're going to be safer. It's not true. You're actually hurting yourself. So be aware and evaluate the shared risk and the share reward, right? It's okay to ask some questions. What is the pay? How much time are you asking? Are you going to give me some resources to do this? Does this match my highest priorities? Do I really, really have the time given everything else I'm doing? Is it, is it super tied to my values, right? Does it, does it mean something to me when I leave this earth and I did or did not do this thing? Will I have regrets about it? Be very specific about your time, resources, and energy. And really build that muscle. This is going to take practice of saying no or negotiating the things that just simply do not align and don't make sense, <laughs> have little or no impact. And we do this a lot in every organization. There's a lot of good intentions, right? We come up with these, you know, initiatives and these <laughs> programs and, you know, we copy what the other universities are doing. There's like a long list of things and ideas that we think are really going to like do something. And there comes a time where we forget the purpose and it didn't have the impact that we thought it did, but because everyone's doing it and we already said we're doing it, we just don't have enough practice with like just eliminate it. Like, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to do everything that everybody else does. And if it's not really valuable, practice that muscle and letting it go and going back to the drawing board and doing something that matches your capacity, your resources. Um, and that's, that's makes sense. So have some realistic op optimism, right? You gotta be really aware of the reality of, of where you are and where you're doing this work and who you're doing this work with. There's some places in, all, in organizations or teams or volunteer work where you're like, we just don't have the resources. We don't have enough social capital. Like, you know, so many people are against us. Maybe my time and energy could be, you know, maybe redirected in a, in a, set, in a way that still meets my values and what it is that I wanna do, but in a different way. Acknowledge the truth. We gotta get real about where we are and what's really happening. You think about that even in the political world where people have all these ideas and grand things that they're gonna do and then they get in the system and they're like, ooh, <laughs> I don't know. This is gonna be a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. And so we wanna look at the long-term achievement of that goal. Like Dr. King said, I may not get to that mountaintop with you. I mean, he knew I, it, I'm not going to get there with you. And my, my kids may not get there with me. I may not get there, right? But I'm doing the work to my, my capacity. I am feeling joy and enjoying all of the rights that I do have. And I'm going to do my part. And I'm going to trust and have belief and faith that in the long term, it's going to work out. You can inspire and motivate and influence and encourage people and celebrate and award, but don't try to control or judge another person's willingness or capacity. This will only make you angrier and bitter when you start to look at someone else's contributions and feel like it's not enough or they don't care enough or they're not doing enough. Everybody has to make this personal decision and you can motivate, influence, and inspire, but don't try to take over and control. Be creative and bounce back from a different angle. Keep going back to the drawing board and learn to let things go that need to be let go. And that's pretty much all I have. It's a lot. It's a lot of practice, right? I wish that you could have come here with something that said, this is how you do it and magically make all these feelings go away, and, but you're gonna have to work at it. So I'd like to open up a little couple minutes for questions or comments or just anything that you're stuck on. How are people feeling? 
All right, thank you. What, well, more importantly, this is what I really wanna ask is, what are you gonna do differently this week? What's your commitment? And can I help, help with the chat? I can't see for some reason. Oh, there it goes. Somebody's got their hand up. Shelly? Hi there, thank you. This has been so helpful. Um, that very last slide I think was really helpful for me because um, you know, I feel like I can take all of these things in and, and, and um, use them for myself, but I'm also um, wanting to inspire my team and the, and the people that I work with um, to take care of themselves and to, um, you know, fight the fatigue. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any tips for really taking care of the team and getting them to, you know, I'm noticing as the pandemic comes on and we're really dealing with some heavy stuff, people being, you know, everybody's a little bit short tempered and, and quick to judge and, you know, mm -hmm. to really build that inclusive environment where people can express themselves because we're all going through it and it can be helpful to other people, but really to inspire and motivate and encourage um, and help them. Number one, model. Mm -hmm. Model your healthy behaviors. You know, if you're leading the meeting and you're you're saying that you're in charge of this team, do we need the meeting today? <laughs> right. Do people need more time? Like we get into these, we get into these things, these, these systems and these habits that we we are so tied to doing things the same way that even when we are aware that people are fatigued and burnt out, we want to we don't want to change something to help them relieve that burnout, right? And so it starts by looking at some of the things that you're doing on your team and your department that need to be eliminated, that that are a waste of time, right? That you need to talk to your supervisor and managers and higher ups to say, hey, my team is burning out. I think we can eliminate items three through five on these objectives, because those are the low, lowest hanging fruit and not going to have um, as much impact and they take a lot of time. So really modeling that and, and, and seeing where you can do something different in terms of your leadership to make things less fatiguing, and then inviting people in to get really, really pinpoint, very pinpoint on what part of their work and job and is being the most out of balance, right? And what can they do to bring it closer back to the green? Help them explain what's going on within their brain and within their system. See if they can resonate with that. Find out how can they get more on this level? And they have to answer that for themselves, right? By doing what you guys did, you said, I know I have to have meditation. I know I have to go outside. I know I've got to play with my pets. Ask your team members, what's the one thing that you've given up that has made you the most fatigue and how can you get it back? And how can I help you? What can I relieve from your plate? How can we advocate for more time, more resources? But having those discussions and getting really real and being willing to do something different when you find out the answer. I hope that's helpful. Very, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? It's hard for me to see these. Any other hands raised? Okay. I can uh, share something, Tracy. Yes. So I made this interesting choice um, to bring a guitar in the office um and so um and during just before you know our winter break was starting to be better about and intentional about playing taking breaks and playing it um and the off and folks in the office enjoyed it but it was a really um knowing that music is such a core part of my life and it relieves stress and you know uh, music therapy, you know, we, I, I know all about it. Hopefully others know more about it, but that has made a difference. And yeah. so now getting ready to go back in the office, making sure that I take that time to pick up the guitar. I brought it in the office for a reason and use it so that I can be more mindful um, when meeting and role modeling for the people that I'm working with. Wonderful. And may I ask you a question? When you Absolutely. Say, when you say you want to go back to it, what do you think was the reason why you moved away from it? Um, 
I just was, it was too busy. Like, you know, I was so focused on, I had to do everything and I had to be at everything. Um, and that in order for me to show that it mattered, I had to be there or be working on it, that I just wasn't making the time to rejuvenate and, and put myself in a place that allowed me to um, be more open to seeing the great things. Like for me, music shifts, can shift things for me. Yes. Um, and so getting back to that in me was important. So okay. and did that answer it, Tracy? You answered it. And so my next question is, what are you going to need to to say no to or let go of if you're too busy? Uh, those are good questions. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I think I think there's going to be some things to where I think you brought us some really good points of that. I feel like I have to be doing it to make sure um, that people see that I'm committed to change and doing those things. But there's also going to be, am I getting everything that I best that I can by volunteering for everything? Right. Right. And so there's going to have to be some things to where even if it is really meaningful, I may have to say no, because it may take away from some of the other things, or I may not be able to do it as well as I hope to do yep. um, because I'm stretching myself out too thin. Thank you. That's, that's what I'm hoping you walk away with. You're going to have to say no to something or renegotiate the terms so that you have more time for your guitar, which helps you to do all of the other projects better. And so we don't get to have all of it, right? And it's gonna be uncomfortable that if you're making that commitment to bring that back and it brings you joy and it makes you creative and it shifts the mood, something has to go in order for you to have time to do that. And that's the muscle that we have to build. And I, I trust that you're going to be able to do that and enjoy yourself again and, and help your team as well. Thank you. Well, thank you all for, for sharing. Thank you, Joseph, for that example. That's the real takeaway. Something has to go if you are not, or if you're going to have your self-care needs as non-negotiables. They're not negotiable right? If that's the thing that keeps you alive and well. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. This executive came to something that we're doing and obviously they get asked to go like to a million things. Like, I mean, sure. They're just always asked to be doing all kinds of stuff and they can't do it all. And so this person was so like, like just so laser focused. I am going to go because it's on my way to the, the, the most important thing that I need to do but I'm only going to spend this amount of minutes. And as soon as that clock hits, I'm out the door and I'm letting you know that now, as soon as that clock hit, that person got up <laughs> and left the building. It's, it's like they, they don't have that sense of guilt or, or maybe they don't, they do, but they're willing to work through that guilt to say no, or to renegotiate so that they can do the things that matter the most to them. And the, and the things that are going to give them the greatest bang for their buck. And all the other stuff that that doesn't is not as effective, they have no problem saying, I'm sorry, I just don't have time in my schedule, maybe next quarter. Okay. Well, thank you all. Is there any other questions? I, I hope that you walk away with uh, some tips and some things that you're going to do differently and develop that muscle. It's a muscle. You've got to practice taking in the good. You've got to practice experiencing that positivity and changing your brain. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much, Tracy. And as folks are leaving, I have a couple of things that I'm hoping to share with this group. Number one, inviting, uh, well, reminding folks that we um, are, we did record the event and the recording will be made available online. I'll also be sending it out to all the folks who registered for this event. And I also want to um, give a plug for our next book project program, I'm hoping that you'll be able to join. This will be next um, week, next Wednesday, February 2nd at noon. Our partners at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing will host a meeting of the Interprofessional Book Club. This is the third of three meetings. And um, we've had two really fantastic meetings so far and really had an opportunity to learn from one another and learn about how the book How to Be an Anti-Racist, we see it playing out in our professional and personal lives and, and really having an opportunity to connect that book with some theory as well. 
Um, the session will be facilitated by Kukiri Ackerman Barger, who is Associate Dean for Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and a Clinical Professor and Director of Faculty Development for Education and Teaching at the School of Nursing. I'll put into chat um, more information about how you can access this event. And finally, um, we would love your feedback on today's event. And um, we certainly welcome you to fill out this survey. I'll be dropping a link into chat and you also can access the survey via QR code that you'll see on your screen. As an incentive and thank you for your participation, at the end of the survey, you'll have an opportunity to enter into a prize drawing for a ticket to see this year's book project featured author Ibram X. Kendi at the Mandavi Center on March 31st. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Tracy, for your wisdom. I always appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. And I'm it's, it's nearing the end of the day. I'm feeling really invigorated. I'm sure others do as well. Thank awesome. you so much to all and hoping to see you at a future program. Awesome. Thank you, Megan, so much for all your hard work. These are not easy to put together, so I appreciate you so much. Okay. Thank you all.